everyone. Howdy. Good morning. Hey. Welcome to yet again another Monday night workshop on a rainy night. Was it still raining when you guys came in? No. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice to hear the rain on the sun. If I missed that. Well, so the first thing I want to do is acknowledge all people who have just completed Omega One. Thank you for joining me. They survived. <laughs> Then um, anybody who here is here for the first time, if you would, just worry. Your, you know, all right. First time uh, for Monday. Any, oh, Andrew, can you give it to Andrew? Yeah. 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 Let's see, anybody wearing brown, I just want you to have another third one. Anyone? Yeah. 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 Three. <laughs> so obviously we just finished our Omega One last night. It was a full house and really, I felt like it was a pretty good program. We. Um, had 33 people, I think it was, is what we ended up with, 33 people, which was nice. The last one that we're going to do for the year until we have a list, obviously. So now we're just on the waiting list era step, stage. Uh, so once we have enough people to register for any other program, a one, a four, a two, or the satsang, or the satsang, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and put one on. Of course, right now is the good season for Franciscan. I mean, it's really booked here. I think they're booked pretty much almost every weekend now for the end of the year. So it's likely that we wouldn't be able to get in unless there's a cancellation. So I'm looking probably to do, I'd like to do a one in January and then a two possibly in February and anywhere in between if we can get a set saying in there, that would be great. I know some people have been asking about the four. Um, a four takes some time to get to it because we need at least two or three omega ones to fill a two, and then two or three omega twos to fill a four. So, we, my priority right now would be to fill up the ones as much as I can. <clears throat> so, hopefully, I don't I don't know how the phones went on today, but I think from last night's training we had about eight to ten. Eight. Eight people for the two. Yeah. So that's nice. So that keeps our numbers up for the two. <clears throat> And then we're going to continue on with the Monday night workshops. Will you please remind me again, Mark, in November and December now, October, November, December, we're good for the rest of the year on the first Mondays. There's no changing. Okay, good. And then I believe we've already scheduled for the first Mondays of every Monday next year in 2016. That's such a weird thing to think. I'm going to 2016. Although the other day I was writing and I wrote 2017. I'm like, wow, I'm futurizing. <laughs> so, um, but we do have them all scheduled for next year, which I'm looking forward to. We are also working with um, Angela. Those of you who might know Angela, she lives in San Diego. She is doing our media launch. We are redesigning the website. She's going to get us up and socially connected with everything that is out there, apparently. I don't know everything that's there, but I'm guessing Facebook. I know Facebook. I think we're connected with LinkedIn and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram. She did say that Instagram would be a good one she could do. And then, um, I don't know, the social media thing. But I think what she's going to do is format it so it all looks congruent. <coughs> congruent. I just did a training, so my voice is going to go in and out. <coughs> but we just did one so everything will look congruent and then set up a blog <coughs> for me as well. My task now is to look through all of the writings that I have from either myself or George. I have some videos of George too from Monday Night Workshops, but I don't really want to, I mean audios, I don't want to really release the ones when his voice was very weak. It's a little hard to hear. So I've been um, listening to previous ones. He's got a good one on the virtues. I think I might release that one for podcasts. That's what we're thinking. That's the other thing was to start releasing podcasts, which <clears throat> I've just found out are things that you listen to on your headsets <laughs> and you don't need video, you just listen to the audio, which is, I guess, kind of like books on tape. So, that, or George on tape. Do they say books on tape anymore or is it just audible? It's audibles, it's not books on tape. <clears throat> yeah, I just dated myself, books on tape. <laughs> I still have VCRs. <laughs> the VCR card, I still have those. I just, for some reason, I don't want to let those go. I actually... Oh, well, I won't even go there. Okay, so, I think that's all that takes care of it. I'm sorry, I really haven't used my voice today intentionally because I knew I was going to have a hard time speaking, but it's going to come and I have, I have some water. So, 
Tonight's topic, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight, first of all. Tonight's topic, acceptance or surrender, is there a difference? I actually uh, found a little video today with Oprah. I've never, uh, I'll admit this, I've never seen her. I know she was on TV forever and a day and then launched a lot of beautiful goodwill things and has made a great contribution, but quite honestly, I don't think I've ever watched one of her shows, maybe snippets here and there, or like people say, oh, you'll watch this little thing. So I um, saw this, she has something called Soul Sunday, I guess, where she does a little interview with somebody. And it was a gentleman, his name was Mark Nepo, and I forget the book that he wrote, I think it was A Thousand Ways of Thinking, or Seven Thousand Ways of Doing Something. But he had a clip because I typed into Google Surrender and Acceptance to see what would come up. And there was a lecture from, or a little clip from him. It was a four-minute little video. And he had this uh, really beautiful picture of the difference between acceptance and surrender. He said that surrender is like a fish finding the current and then going with it. And acceptance is when you meet the driftwood or a stone or you get stuck on the bank and then you continue on. It's like you get tripped up by something but then keep going on. I kind of like that. The surrender I got... But the acceptance, naturally, I struggled with since I've always struggled with um, the idea of acceptance. So, it's no surprise, I've often talked about how I've struggled with the idea of acceptance because I've always pictured that as a doormat. <laughs> you don't just accept, you do. You make something happen. And so, I grew up with the idea that acceptance, or came to the idea that acceptance is a noble thing, and surrender is, um, it really meant to just give up. That's really when I put the two together, but not a good give up. It was a give up like, ugh, you're defeated and you walk away and you haven't achieved anything. So, let me just read through some of the things that I wrote down. Acceptance has been more like a mantra, that, and that's really what it came to, like a mantra. So if somebody's standing in front of me and they're very confrontive or combative, I would just say inside myself, I accept you, I accept you, I accept you. Not knowing what it means, because I clearly, no one's giving me an instruction, what does acceptance, how do you do it? You do one, two, three, four, there's no steps. You're just told, accept. Okay, so I just do the mantra. I accept you, I accept you, and what I'm really saying is I'm waiting for you to shut up so I can leave, because <laughs> it's not acceptance. <laughs> I'm just waiting, so I just run through this, I accept you, I accept you, when honestly, it's a contradiction. I'm not truly accepting you, I'm just saying those words. Then I have um, surrender, and as I said, I think surrendering was just shrugging your shoulders and walking away. So I started thinking, um, the first time I heard about the word acceptance as a youngster in child, in uh, religious education. Accept God's will. Accept Jesus into your heart. Thy will be done, not mine. So again, a seven-year-old doesn't understand, but what do you mean, you put Jesus in my heart? What? Like, I don't understand what you mean by that. And then accept God's will. So it was kind of like a choice, but not really a choice. Anybody ever, uh, Roman Catholic, so I grew up as a Roman Catholic. You have to do communion, and then you have to do your confirmation. There is no I want to, it's this is what you do. So there wasn't really a choice in the matter, it was this is what you do. So that's kind of what I associated acceptance with. You have no choice, you just do it. But again, no steps to it. You know, just here, this is what you do. You kneel, you pray. It's kind of like, you know when you went to church and you learned how to do, well, you probably haven't done this, but you learned how to do the Our Father, you know, and you got, you know, you got that, or the Hail Mary, and you had to say the Hail Mary, and when to stand, and when to kneel, and, you know, you always got so excited because when you got the routine right, it's like you stood when everyone stood, you sat when everyone sat, you did the kneeling, you turned into the hand thingy, the peace be with you thing. How many people can you shake hands with? <laughs> So that's what I thought it was. You just follow the rules. So to me, acceptance was you, it's just what you do. Follow the rules and then surrender. You just give up. So there isn't even following rules. You just give up. Especially when I thought about it in um, history. So this was really good because in school, armies that surrendered are the ones that lost. So they battled, they tried, and they didn't succeed. So again, surrender meant, ah, you turkeys, you lost. So that's really what I had that little connection with, that when you, um, as a matter of fact, the soldiers put down their rifles and hands up in the air, and they often say, I give up. That's it, I give up or I surrender, I give up. 
So I equated I give up and surrender together. So when you give up, you lose. That's really what it, in my little brain, that's what I created. When I was left, anybody ever play hide the sink when you were young? Love that game. I still play it with my grandchildren. I love hide and go seek, and I never gave up. I, oh, I would go until I found everyone, and sometimes it would be a long time, but I wouldn't give up. I refused to. It wasn't so much a competitive nature, or maybe it was, but I really had it in my head. If I gave up, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm surrendering, and I can't do that. So I made sure I'd go find, and I was pretty good at finding good hiding spots anyway, so I would go and look, and there would be a couple times where I'd be hiding, and the kids gave up and didn't tell me. <laughs> so I'm still like way up in a tree waiting for someone to come find me, <laughs> and no one did, because we played around the block. We also used to play block tag, which you could run and use the whole block, and our property was the place that was safe, so we'd cut through people's neighborhoods. Probably did a lot of very dangerous things back then. <laughs> but I never gave up. I would keep going because giving up was not an option. And that's really how I was. I understand losing. I mean, you know, play a board game, you lose, I get it. That's okay, you did your best. But giving up, you just gave up. That's wrong. You're not supposed to do that. So that's how the words acceptance in my mind is. I have no idea what it is, you just do it. And then surrender, you give up. And that's so bad, and I guess a noble cause, because it's always being told you're supposed to accept. And then, of course, when I entered into the New Age realm, there's so many books out there that talk about acceptance and love and compassion and Buddhist, the seven steps or eight steps, the unknoble truths and acceptance and, and, and you know, see things as they are. Okay, so it's a blue chair. Does that mean I accept that it's a blue chair or it's just a blue chair and I'm just stating a fact? So I don't know if I was just thinking too much on this or, you know, just be. Hmm, just be. Be. Let's see, how do I accept and just be? Well, am I just being by standing here? Or am I being because I'm thinking I'm being? Or am I being or not being because I'm trying to be? You know, like then my head would just get into, welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> now, I'll tell you this. I've never really favored the idea of surrender. So I may have told this story uh, once before, and if you've heard it, you'll hear me say it again. When I was little, um, we spent our summers on the beaches at uh, swim classes. That's what we'd go to every summer, eight weeks or something, we'd go and learn how to swim. <clears throat> and at the end of every summer, there would be competitions, like races. And you'd get a first place ribbon and a second place ribbon and a third place ribbon. So I even remember this. The first place was blue, the second place was yellow, and the third place was red. And you know, I'd get maybe one or two ribbons each year. Well, my final year, I was 15 or 16 years old, just about to go into high school. So I was in the junior high, the junior lifeguard section now. So I had gone through all the classes, maybe seven or eight years now. I've been through, knew everybody on the beach, knew all the teachers, knew all the lifeguards. I was a very good swimmer. Very fast kid too, so very athletic. So it comes to the races, everybody knows, oh, yeah, Marie's gonna get all the first places. You know, I'm like the, what do you do, the, the sure thing or something? That, that was me. You know, I put their bets on Anne Marie because she's the one who's going to do it. So the first race I do, it was, um, so it was low tide. Now I'm short, okay, remember, so it's low tide. And so it was raced from one end to the other end. They have the buoys, but they took me and put me all the way out at the furthest end. So I'm treading water while I'm waiting for everyone else to get in line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not saying that's the reason, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm treading water, and then the kids down at the end could kick off the sand because they're touching the wall. So they're like going fat. I'm like, hey, 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 hey. So I finally caught up, but I really double timed it, and I'm telling you that this really annoyed me. As my hand was coming down, the kid right next to me grabbed me and put her hand. She went like this and grabbed, and so the lifeguard called her. So I'm like, da da da! But I'm in the furthest, deepest end, so I kind of went underwater, and she won first place, and I got second. So I started off not feeling good. Next race, it was running all the way out to the water. Then there's a lifeboat way out there. You had to swim to the lifeboat, around the lifeboat, and then return back to the sand to the starting spot. Piece of cake. I start running now because it's low tide, and I'm a sprinter. I beat all the kids to the water. 
and I'm jumping the waves instead of starting right in. I mean, I just kept leaping over waves until I would get to a part like right here, and then I would dive in. Made it to the lifeboat on my way back, and the kids are just now getting to the lifeboat. So as I'm coming around, they're going there. I'm going to make this. I get all the way towards the shore, and as I go to stand, the tide, the currents, those of you who know there's undercurrents, undercurrent caught me. And when I went to stand, I got knocked off balance, and I kind of stumbled a little bit. And when I finally stood, my left ankle went under me, and I, I kind of like stepped on my feet and went down. And then kind of crawled a couple places and then just sat there. A little confused, and I'm certain I was probably embarrassed, but at the time I was just stunned, like, did I just fall? What the heck was that? Like, and plus the current, you never really know when the current's going to get you, so I was quite surprised about that. So I remember sitting there, and all of a sudden, I, out of the corner of my eye, I see the, the second place girl come running up, and she runs right to me and says, are you okay? And I'm like, I still don't say anything. I'm just looking at her a little dazed, and I kind of shake my head yes, thinking she's going to help me up. She runs to, to the finish line and leaves me sitting there, and I'm like, what? Like, another thing, like, what do you mean? You just took that ice? And then as I'm sitting there watching her, the next kid goes running by, and now I'm mad. <laughs> and sitting there, and I'm watching every kid go by, and finally my teacher comes up to me and says, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you just sitting there? And I just remember shrugging my shoulders and not even wanting to speak to her. And what I connected with was, not only was I just embarrassed, but it was the first time I gave up. I mean, I could just easily got up and, and went, but I didn't. I gave up. I don't know why. I don't know what it was that caused me to give up. I'm suspecting it was because I was embarrassed that I fell, because I'm the sure thing. But I didn't, I didn't even get a ribbon in that one. I didn't even get up and cross the finish line. So I can tell you that day, I didn't get any first base ribbons that I was supposed to get. And I connect that with surrendering. So it's, and it left such a bad feeling, a bad taste in my mouth, like surrendering, giving up. I never wanted to have that feeling again. I really did feel like I was a quitter. And, and I guess for the rest of my life, whenever I see somebody who surrenders, I'm really the one who goes, come on, you can do this, you can do this, and kind of push the kids along the way rather than have the feeling of just giving up. So when it comes to surrender, I've already said that it, it connects with giving up for me. And then back to the word acceptance. So when I think about acceptance, throughout the years I've fluctuated between the idea that acceptance is, it fluctuates between not doing anything, because you're just supposed to do what you're supposed to do, or some quality of giving up, but this time it means like giving up um, an attachment or an agenda. So when I accept somebody, I'm accepting them for who they are, not wanting them to be a certain way. But that's where I've kind of got. So I would go back and forth between not doing anything or uh, I'm just going to give up and let this person be who they are, or let the event unfold the way it unfolds. So just release, so give up my attachment or my expectations of something. So I've given you a little summation of the difference for me, surrender and acceptance. What I'd like you to do is have a conversation with someone and talk about what your belief systems of acceptance and surrender. If you see them as the same, if you see them as something different. So talk to someone about <coughs> acceptance and surrender. Go ahead. Please. May I have your attention, please? So, hopefully you've had an opportunity to talk about acceptance and surrender. It's like we're accepting the fact that something's falling on top of it. <laughs> doesn't sound like rain. <laughs> um, or that does sound like rain. I was going through George's files, and I found this... Uh, very weathered piece of paper that he had typed out, and you can tell it was a typewriter. <laughs> the saying says, I accept you as you are, as you may have been in the past. Can you still hear me? That's pretty loud, isn't it? That's awesome. Oh, it rains every time I'm in here. I'm not accepting this. <laughs> All right, I accept you as you are, as you may have been in the past, and in as you may become in the future, and I grant you full freedom to become and, and be that which you consider suitable. I've never really heard it quite said in that term, 
And then the second part of it says, I accept me as I am, as I maybe have been in the past, as I may become in the future, and I grant me full freedom to become and be that which I consider suitable. So that left me thinking, what is suitable? I mean, a thief might think it's suitable to be a good thief, and a murderer might think it's suitable to be a good murderer. So I mean, is this deal with morality or individuality? So it really had me thinking a bit. But then when I stop and we can look at the idea. So I accept as I am and as I may have been in the past. Okay, in the past, wild party animal, get it. Not that way anymore. Can I accept that I was that way? Absolutely. I have fond memories, the ones I remember, of the wild party animal. Not a problem. So may I accept how I am in the future? Sure, I think I can accept my future ever it unfolds. As long as it goes the way I want it to, that'd be great. I can accept that. That would be wonderful. And then grant me full freedom to become and be that which I consider to be suitable. So I'm assuming that deals with my morality. But the thing I struggle with is when I say I accept you for who you are. I can do that. I accept you for who you are. But for who you have been in the past. Now this I have a problem with. I've discovered this. Okay, you can tell me that, as a matter of fact, I don't want to disclose this, but I did have a buddy who didn't rape a girl, but his brother did, and he's the one who facilitated it. He got the girl to come over to the house, blah, blah, blah. Once I discovered that with him, I did not accept it. If I'm supposed to accept how you were in the past, and that happened 15 years ago, it shouldn't matter to me, but that revolted me. I really said, uh-uh. So I was put to the position, wow, maybe I don't accept people from their past. I have a pretty good, if somebody has a drug abuse and drug addiction and they're no longer, I'm good with that if you're clean. But does it leave the back of my mind that you may slip up? Depends on who you are. If you've proven that, yeah, you're pretty good, hey, I, I don't think I think a second thought. But if you still have characters in your life that are influencing you, I don't think it leaves my thought. I think it's always back there. Is that non-acceptance or protection? So as you're going to get here, I'm not going to give you any solutions. I'm just giving you the questions <laughs> to think about it, because that's what I really think it's more about, is to thinking. I don't really want to have a, this is how it is, because obviously everyone's thought process is going to be different. So if I, if I look in the past and I say, oh, I accept the abusive childhood that I have, I do. But when I talk about it, I still have energy. I still experience pain every day of my life. I have pain. Have I accepted that? I think I have. I think I just accept I'm in pain. That's OK. It doesn't bother me anymore. It's just a pain. But when I think of the memories of when it happened, I still have that reaction. Like I relive. You know how your body can still have a physical reaction. So I relive it. Does that mean I'm not accepting it? Or am I just reliving it? I think about like the protectiveness that I would have. Somebody who injures my children leaves, gone for 10 years, and then returns. Am I going to want to protect them? You bet. Will I accept this person? Their claim to renew livelihood? Mm -hmm. Because I saw the pain they caused on, the, on my kids. No, I, I don't accept them. And I know I'm very, very guarded whenever this woman is around. The girl, I'm very guarded because I want to protect them. Same thing with my parents. Do I accept them? Absolutely. I accept that they're human beings who are doing the best they can. But if they attack my children, you got it. Uh, forget it. They go after Mark's kids. Uh-uh. I'm, <laughs> I'm, if I accept you, it shouldn't bother me what you say. It shouldn't bother me that you choose one over the other. What? That shouldn't surprise me. <laughs> but it does. So. I'm aware that I don't have a lot of acceptance. I have the theory of acceptance, and I understand it. But it's almost like I pick and choose what I want to accept and what I don't want to accept. And that seems like a contradiction. It, it sounds like accepting me is everything. And if I pick and choose, I'm not accepting. I'm still having judgments or um, expectations. Challenges would be a really good philosophy right there. So, I know that there's areas in my life that I surrender to, but I still resent. I resent the fact that I had to surrender. It's not what I wanted to do, but I surrendered, because that's what was the higher way of doing. 
and, and even in that, I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I mean, if it really was the higher way of doing, I wouldn't have gone, I ain't mean, doing. But then, oh no, that's okay, you go ahead. <laughs> so there are times when I know I still have that resentment. And, it, and it's, it's like a splinter, it festers. And you know it's there, and every time you're in the same situation, oh, there's a person in the room. <laughs> so that's a lack of, is that a lack of acceptance or a lack of surrendering? I'm not sure. So there are areas in my life that I've surrendered to and I resent the fact that I had to surrender, almost like it wasn't my choice. I was told I had to surrender. And then there's areas that I think I'm accepting, but I'm not. I still have reactions. I think any time I have a, a reaction or a judgment or a criticism or attachments or any kind of emotional fuel, I don't think I'm accepting. Even though I say I'm accepting, I don't think I am because I still have that reactive nature. If, it, if I really did accept, it wouldn't matter who was or what you said or did. I, it wouldn't bother me. So I feel like I can say the words, but it doesn't show up in my behavior quite well. So I want you to have a conversation with the first idea of the ability to surrender, but you still resent surrendering. And then is it really surrender? So talk about a situation that you had to surrender and you still have resentment over it. Or maybe you don't, maybe it's just me. <laughs> and then um, if you still have that resentment about it. So have a conversation about surrendering and resentment, please. May I have your attention, please? I had you actually talk because I wanted to come up with a couple of examples and I couldn't think of any, so I sent you to talk about on your own. But I did now just think of a few examples of surrendering and not uh, and resenting it, or of uh, watching other people. So I remember in 1992 when George closed down Omega, people surrendered to it, but they resented it, <laughs> especially in Canada when they <laughs> they just bought a building for Omega, and George says, "Oh, by the way, we're closing the program down." They're like, "What?" So that was a good example of resentment, surrendering. But I don't know if that's what George wants, but I know there was a lot of talk afterwards that were not quite hefty. Um, uh, when we had the Delta building up in the Peoria, the woman who sold the building, she sold it because she wanted us to use her other building up in Sedona. She wanted to move us to Sedona. So I surrendered to that, but I resented the fact that somebody was trying to manipulate George and the organization. That, that was like, what? Just because you have money, you're just going to tell us where to go. And then, I, this is funny too, so my dad, when I went to college, uh, my older brother stayed home, so he went to college and went to a community college. I was the first one to leave the house, and I went as far in New York as I could get, into Buffalo, and um, my father said, if you stay home, I'm like ready to leave, if you stay home, I'll pay for your entire school, but if you leave, I'm not giving you a penny. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> and he didn't give me a penny. <laughs> so I presented that. Like, he took care of everyone else, but just because I chose to do something different, I don't get the support like everyone else. I shouldn't say that. He actually ended up doing, um, when I graduated, I got, because he was surprised I actually graduated in four years. <laughs> um, so he gave me the certain, the same, I think $1,000, like he gave everybody $1,000 who graduated. But I remember. What it came down to, or this is what it comes down to, I can surrender, but if I feel like I'm being manipulated, I resent it. If there's no manipulation in there, then I don't resent it. I, oh, I get it. And sometimes I surrender because that's what, like I said, is sometimes you do because you're told. Many times, loved George, totally loved George, but sometimes he was quite hard on feedback when you receive it 24 hours a day. So you would surrender, but then be like, can you please just give me a break? And I was thinking of this this morning, how George was really good on feedback. He loved negative feedback, because there's contribution. And I agree, well, the best way for me to grow is through the negative contribution. But it got to a point where all I was receiving was the negative feedback and that's what I started doing was all I would focus on would be the negative feedback and I realized I was doing it with the kids and grandchildren, you don't do that to kids, but that became my nature. It was I wasn't seeing the good anymore, I was trying to help you. So, oh, did you know you did that? Did you know you did that? Did you know? And that wasn't helpful. So it took me a while to come back and recognize, oh yeah, I have to say the positive as well as the negative, there is value. And that's probably the last hurdle I overcame. 
as a facilitator. I'm always good at finding the things I did wrong. I see, I didn't say wrong. The things I am critical about, but to find things that I think I'm successful in, I don't, I don't, I still don't favor that. But that was the last hurdle to actually acknowledge. Okay, yes, I did make a contribution because I was trained in such a manner to look for the negative, and I and I went with it. I'm sure that's not what George intended, but that's what I went with because I'm the all or nothing person. <laughs> so. Um, when it was manipulation, when it involves manipulation, that's when I resent. And how long do I hold on to the resentment? Good question. Let's see, I'm 53, 2, 52. <laughs> I resent the fact that I just made myself older. <laughs> uh, I, I can say almost my whole life I still hold on to it. I, it's not that I hold the grudge, but I know I can pull it forward going, oh yeah, that really bothered me. But honestly, I'm sitting here thinking, I can't think of a negative thing that George said that I'm still holding on to, because I really think everything he said was very dead on. I think it's just the overall is what I resent, the overall nonstop. I was um, sharing with somebody last week about the final months of George and how sweet, loving, beautiful man, but when you have Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, no one told me this, but you can turn into a vicious, violent individual. So there were times when he tried to throw me down the stairs. This little 70 pound old man would all of a sudden become really strong and try to throw me down the stairs because I was blocking him from leaving the house at 2.30 in the morning because he wanted to go home, not realizing we were home. So, or wanting, accusing me of imprisoning him and he wants to go see people that were, had passed away and trying to explain to him they're no longer here, and then finally having to lie and say, oh, they're in bed, or you just saw them today. I, you know, I feel horrible about lying, but it was anything to do to get him. So there were times where I resented the fact that I had to lie, or I resented the fact that I had to do something I didn't want to do, like to lock the doors so that he couldn't get out of the room in the middle of the night because he could potentially fall and hurt himself. I resented having to do things that were against what I would, why would you want to do that to another person? And I understand it's the protective, I get it, it has to be protection. So there's things like that I know I still resent and still feel that, but I knew it was necessary to do. Know it's necessary to do. Um, when I was uh, growing up, the idea of um, the, don't come, just come back. <laughs> but not resenting. So, uh, resenting. So, one thing that used to happen is, uh, my father especially would put us on the line. Anytime something happened, we, we always used to have a phrase in the house, if anything happened, Anne Marie did it. I mean, there was no question. It was just, oh, Anne Marie always naturally did it. Nobody, so half the time I'd be getting hit, and I had no idea what I was getting hit for. <laughs> I just saw something happen. But, um, and most of the time it was my sister. I'm saying this right now, if you're watching this video. <laughs> I have no resentment about that, really. So, <laughs> But what he would do is there'd be four of us in line, or it would be this way, so older brother, me, younger brother, sister, and the, ba the baby sister. And so he'd do the interrogation thing with a strap. Well, who did this, blah, 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 walking back and forth, like intimidating you. And I know standing there, I'm gonna get hit, and I'm trying to figure out what happened. Like, what, what's the big thing? And I'm looking and looking, and then you can always tell who did it. Most of the time it was my sister, but she'd be like the shaking. <laughs> so and then I'd be like, oh great, she did something again, and now I'm going to get it for it. So he'd go back and forth, and my older brother would get hit once for being the oldest and not telling us what to do. My youngest sister would get hit once for being the baby, for following along with everyone. My younger brother would get hit three times, no explanation. And then I would get hit, obviously, I was the one who did it. So that routine. So many times, if my... Um, mother had fueled the fire, my father would be trying to prove that he was being diligent in the discipline, so he'd be a little bit harder on me. Um, so there were times where my younger brother would jump on top of me and protect me. Never asked him to, he always would. He would just dive on top of me and protect me. So I was thinking about resentment. Did my younger brother resent doing that? Because my older brother could have done it and he didn't. My sister could have done it she didn't. I'm sure she felt a lot of guilt because I was catching a lot of her blame. But my younger brother would always, every once in a while, he'd be the one diving. He'd say, enough, and just dive on top, causing him to get hit. But then, and, and I think he figured this out, because he was my mother's favorite, 
if he was getting hit, my mother would stop it. You know, so my brother would figure out if he's on top of me, my mother would jump in, and then there were no more meetings. So I, did my brother ever resent that? My brother's never resented me for that. I don't think he did. But I do know he has not spoken to my father since he was 12 years old. So I'm certain that that resentment probably is seated in there, along with my mother's, because that was her favorite, so she's planted a lot of seeds in his head thinking my dad's Satan. So he hasn't spoken to my dad since he was 12. And this is funny. <laughs> I the first one to leave the house. My sister is the next one. My younger brother stays in the house. By the time I left the house, my older brother left to get married. And so the only one still in the house is my younger brother. My mother leaves my dad. So here's my younger brother who doesn't speak to my dad and my father living in the same house for two years, not speaking to each other. I can't imagine how horrible that must have been for both of them. But my poor dad, you know, all of a sudden, you're stuck with a kid that doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> so I really feel like that, that's probably not funny, huh? Uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, I really feel like Christopher, my younger brother, probably does have a lot of resentment towards my dad for not just so much the beatings, but I think he resents him because of the stuff my mom fed him. Four o'clock in the morning, my mother would often be downstairs in my brother's room crying what a terrible life she had and how terrible my dad was. And you really can turn a child against someone. So I think a lot of the resentment was from my mom too. Remember, bipolar woman, I'm certain she wasn't conscious of her actions. So there's another thing. How do we practice acceptance? Well, that one's easy. I accept, okay, my mom has bipolar. Got it. All right, that's easier. But if my mom didn't have bipolar, would I accept her still? I don't know. The fact that I know there's something wrong with her, oh, okay, I get it. I can have empathy. But what if there wasn't anything wrong with her? Would I still accept her? Can I accept, there's a good challenging question, can I accept ISIS right now? Can I accept people walking around beheading other individuals just because they believe in their conviction? I don't know. I know there's value, but I don't think I can accept that. that. And I think that's okay not to accept it. I think there's times where I shouldn't accept things that, that would be consi considered unacceptable to me. But that's where I'm on the fence. So if the spiritual path is to accept everything, that means I must also accept the things that get me. So I would have to accept a four-year-old's dead body on the beach as a result of people fleeing for freedom. I would have to accept that. Well, yes, it happened. It's a fact. Do I find value? That those are the things we teach ourselves to do. But how do I find the acceptance of that? How, how do I learn to accept that? How, how can I? That, that's what's been flying around in my mind here. So I went to the dictionary, greatest source of information, George has always said, go to the dictionary. So dictionary, acceptance. There are six definitions for acceptance. The first one, to receive willingly, which I never even thought about that, and for example, to accept a gift. The next one, this is actually 1A and 1B, to be able or designed to take or hold of something. So something applied, like a surface that will not accept the ink. Um, to give admittance or approval. I accept her as one of the group. Okay, I get that. To endure without protest or reaction. <laughs> to endure without protest or reaction. And then the little example, accept poor living conditions. <laughs> I have done that <laughs> as a poor college student. Yes, I have. To regard as a proper, normal, or inevitable. The idea is widely accepted. So to regard as proper, normal, and inevitable. This is probably what my de definition has been. You just, it's going to be inevitable, you do it. That's what you do. To recognize as true, like you believe in it. Or for the example, they said refuse to accept the explanation, because you have another one. To make a favorable response to when you accept an offer. I never thought of that one. To agree or undertake a responsibility. I accept a job. Again, I never thought of that one. To assume an obligation to pay or to take in. For example, we don't accept personal checks. And the last one was to receive a legislative report officially, like when you accept a report. So those are different, different. none of them really fulfilled my desire <laughs> to know what acceptance was. And there's nothing spiritual in there. So I struggled a little bit with that one. And then I went to surrender, very simpler. 
to yield to the power, control, or possession of another compulsion or demand. So, like as kids, you surrender the fort. Like, you know, you're, you're surrendering. Put up the white flag, and I surrender. Give up. <laughs> Next one, to give up completely or agree to forego, especially in favor of another one. To give oneself up into the power of another one, especially as a prisoner. Give up. And then to give oneself over to something as an influence. So we can actually surrender to our addictions. And then a lot of people who do the 12 step program surrender to my higher power, is what we said. So those are the two different definitions. Neither one of them helped me. Although surrender was closer to what I thought it was going to be to uh, give up. So what I did is I started looking at a couple other books that I have. I came to um, a book by Torquem Saradere in two very large volumes. It's the Psych and Psychism. And he has a little section in there in the sense of acceptance, like it's our responsibility to practice acceptance. He states that acceptance deals with karma. Now, I can grasp that. That's a little bit more spiritual for me. Karma, if karma is reality, and we're playing out separate lives or continuing living lives, then I can accept the fact that this happens to me in this life, and then in the next life it will happen. I don't have certainty, but if I understand the idea of karma, maybe what's happening to me now is a result of my actions from previous. And if that's true, then I can accept that. Okay, I get it. Consequences. The laws, that's what Hermes talked about, the laws of cause and effect. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, or there's a causation. So for every action, I have a cause. Everything I do, there's always going to be an effect. So if I understand the rhythm and polarities, where I'm going from one to the other side, and there's a rhythm of acceptance and cause, cause and effect, okay, I get that. I could, uh, I could be on one, one end of this cycle. That makes sense to me. Um, he also said that it states the acceptance. Acceptance is related to my attitude towards others. I get that. I understand that. I don't get it. But I understand it's my attitude towards others. So he says, we do not reject a man because of his physical form. So we don't look at him physically. Oh, no, you're not worthy. Well, I do, but some people, I'm kidding, I don't. <laughs> but there have been times where I have seen people who go, oh, no, no, stay, not my desire. You do not consider a man hopeless because he does wrong things. I struggle with this one a little bit, forgetting that people sometimes can be unconscious. Or if I connect it back to the karma, oh, Maybe they're living out a karmic debt. Okay, I can accept that. You accept the divinity in him, not his vices or crimes. I liked that. I accept the divinity in the person, not their vices or their crimes, but that divinity. The principle is we must not lose the thread of divinity in all of our relationships. Now, I really like that idea, the thread of our divinity. Now, that can us <coughs> back to the agreements that we talk about in Omega. Not the agreements, I'm sorry, the values that we talk about in Omega. Love, trust, truth, and giving. That invisible conduit that connects me from you to you, me to you, you to me. I cannot put my finger on it, but it exists. That's the threat. I would say that's the threat of humanity, the threat of our divinity, the highest part of you. If I can remember that, we say this in the classroom, we look in each other's eyes. If I can see me and you and you and me, we're one and the same. So if I can look at people and think, well, there I go. Oh, okay, I can accept that, if I accept me, <laughs> which most of us do, I'm assuming. We mostly accept that. Then I also went to another book, Morals for the 21st Century. This is written by John Baines. It's one of his last books that he's written. He says, empathy is a psychological expression that, among other things, denotes the capacity to put oneself in the place of others and share their feelings. Now, I happen to be a pretty empathetic individual. I can feel what somebody else is feeling. I can feel your pain. Wow, if I can put myself in their shoes, then I can feel what they're going through, then I would be able to accept them. That goes with understanding. When I understand an individual, I expand my capacity, and I no longer have judgment or criticism on them. Oh, I get it. For example, my mom, she has bipolar. Get it, I totally understand that now. So once I step into someone's shoes and have empathy for them, then I have acceptance. Well, I just found my key. How do you practice acceptance? Empathy. Empathy would be a good way to remind myself of the divinity within another individual. 
to remember that that person is just like me, struggling just like I am. I used to, um, well, forget. <laughs> so it has to do with connecting with others. So then what I came to believe is that there's a correlation between giving up and letting go. So the word giving up has always been a bad thing for me. But when I think that giving up is letting go, wow, that completely flips my picture of surrender. If I'm giving up and it means letting go, that involves trust, which is one of our values. Trust. If I have trust, then that sets me free. So I started thinking about all the risks that I've taken that involved letting go. The greatest risks that I've ever had involved letting go. First time I went skydiving, I had to let go of that wing to go skydiving. Otherwise, I'd just be flapping on the wing. <laughs> so I had to let go to go skydiving. I mean, I had a great experience by doing that. In order for me to go snorkeling with the turtles, I had to let go of the handrail of the boat. And even though I didn't want to, because those things are huge, and they swim really fast. <laughs> And I don't have a fear of the turtles, but they're fat. If you've ever been in there, those things are big. But I had to let go and go into the water to have that experience. I had to let go of my fear of birds to stand next to a bald eagle. So I had to let go of something. And every time I let go, I found freedom. I mean, the moment was bigger than I thought it would ever be. I actually had no expectation what it was because I was so focused on the fear. So then I started thinking that surrender had to do with fear, that I was refusing because I was fearful, or I had an agenda. But most of the fear was mostly fear. So then every time, like I said, every time I let go, I found freedom. Whether it was rappelling down a cliff, I had to let go of the security of being on top of a mountain and go down a cliff with a rope that's about that big, <laughs> and it's going to hold me, and it did. And I had to accept the fact that it's raining outside and we're in here today. I think it's just making me have to talk louder, huh? <laughs> but when I went to, gosh, that sounds great. I accepted the fact that, um, oh, kayaking with killer whales. That was terrifying. Even though I did it, I still had fear. Did through three years in a row, I still have fear. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to go with that one. Um, the zip lining in the rainforest, when you're going to go zip lining in the rainforest, you've got to let, and you got to let go. As a matter of fact, my new risk that I'm going to do, I'm going to make this happen, there's a zip line in Vegas. Has anybody seen this one? Oh, it looks awesome. You go over one major street, but you start up really, really high, and you go across the strip and go all the way, I don't know how long it is, but it's a very long line over all the lights and the traffic and everything. It's just, it's incredible. Anyway, you got to let go to do that. Well, that was good. You got to let go to do that. So every time I'm faced with surrender, that means letting go. So by letting go, this reminds me back to the quote that I said earlier, that's like the fish finding the current. So once I find the current, I let go. Richard Bach, remember Richard Bach, those of you might remember him, he had um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel was one of his books. Strange uh, Illusions. Illusions was the one I would go to. The Stranger in a Strange Land. The, the Teachings of the Reluctant Messiah. And in one of the books, The, the Teachings of the Reluctant Messiah, he has a, a cute little story where he talks about the particles in the, in the river that are clinging to the rocks. You have to cling to the rocks. That's your livelihood. It's cling to the rocks, cling to the rocks, cling to the rocks. And one little particle said, but I don't want to do this. There's so much more going why can't I just let go? No, 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 you can't let go. You're not allowed to let go. Well, he did. He let go, and he got smashed about on the rocks for a while, and then finally the current lifted him up, and he floated downstream. And his little community said, well, there you go, told you not to let go, like they thought it was the bad thing. But when he floated downstream and he made it to the next little village, everyone went, look, look, that's Superman. They have superpowers, and they're flying by. <laughs> They didn't say Superman, I added that. But they thought he was like the Messiah because he was floating by. But all he really did was just simply let go. It was what they were afraid to do. That's surrender. I mean, and I loved Richard Bach at one time. So it was a beautiful illustration of surrender. It means you just flow. Go with the flow on that one. So then, <clears throat> the difference between surrender and acceptance, if I flip it now and if I add those key elements, when I accept, 
it, oh, the question was, if I accept, am I letting go too? So does acceptance mean letting go like surrender means letting go? So talk to your buddies about that. Does acceptance means to let go as well? And if you do, what are you letting go? Go ahead, have a conversation, please. All right, if I can have your attention. So what I've come to the understanding for me is that surrendering is letting go and accepting is letting go as well. It seems like accepting is more of an internal, like I'm, I'm accepting and letting go of my judgments. I'm accepting and letting go of my criticism or expectations or attachments. It seems like that's more connected to acceptance, where surrender is more of me trusting. That seems like the number one thing, just not, it's not what I expect it to be, or it's not my will, it's will. <laughs> so just trust, that's really what it falls into. Um, I think about the idea that if I have the inability, again, if we have the inability to find the divinity in the other person, then I'm not experiencing peace. And so I, I feel like that's a connection too, that somehow acceptance would lead me to peace. So surrender leads me to freedom, letting go and trust, and acceptance would lead me to a place of peace and serenity where I'm not, there's no disturbance within me. I have peace with, ev with everyone. George used to say, I can accept a rattlesnake, but I don't need to live with one. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I think that's a good line. Yes, and then we'll sit here out to out of Africa to hold the biggest friggin' snake. <laughs> yes, I remember this. I have, I have actually held a rattlesnake. I have caught a rattlesnake. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I did. This is uh, <laughs> probably no beef. Well, I went to George's house. This is just as he was starting to stumble. and I went to pick him up to bring him to a Monday night workshop, and he was in his kitchen with a broom handle, and I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, no, he chases scorpions and stuff. And I go, what do you do? Did you get a snake or something? I mean, I just joked. I don't even know what made me say snake. And he went, how did you know? And then as soon as he said, how did you know, I looked in the corner right where the patio door was, there was a rattlesnake all curled up. First time I'd ever seen one there. First time I'd actually ever seen a live rattlesnake. And I went, oh god, he's going to try to go out there, and he's already stumbling. And I, George, I'll do it. I've seen the crocodile on yeah. I can do this. I mean, that's how blind I am. So I did. I opened up the patio door and stepped right over the rattlesnake and shut the door behind me. George's eyes were like that. It was really, and he's out the door like this. I go, all right, like, just go sit down. I'll take care of it. It's okay. Because I knew it was looking for a place to get cool. It was hot. It was in the desert. So I had a trash can. And I placed, the so I went over to the, like, the dark section and placed the trash can down on the side. And then it slithered underneath the washing machine. I'm like, oh darn, I don't want to leave it here because he might try to come out and kill it again. So I went and got a flashlight. I took the broom handle from him, the broomstick, put the flashlight underneath, and that little snake's just looking at me. Like, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, come on, buddy. I'm not trying to hurt you. So I put the little stick in there, and sure enough, he slides out. So he was a sidewinder, and he slides out, slides down. Beautiful. Must have been about eight feet. <clears throat> and goes to the lower. Yeah, and I'm standing, I'm not kidding, it's just close. So God, he stand, and he goes down to the lower section. It was the phrase little fellow that got us. Oh. <laughs> so George has a little step about this much in his patio. So when it slid over, it coiled up and then rattled. Now I know when it rattles, that means it's going to strike. And I thought, okay, he's feeling scared. So George had a table, a little wrought iron table. So I reached over, folded the legs over the table, and walked over and put the table over, like on an angle, so he wouldn't feel threatened, and he immediately stopped rattling, but at that moment, the neighbor kid is looking over going, is that a rattlesnake? And I go, um, yeah, there's rattlesnakes here, and I go, well, apparently, yeah, you want to come over and help me? He goes, no. <laughs> I'm like, where's your guy? Come on, get over here. But I didn't, and I was like, well, do me a favor, when I get him, we just open the gate for me so I could take him out. I'm the one who rescues scorpions. I mean, I just pick them up and take them outside. So this, is, so it's not new for me to try to, but this was the first time to get a snake. So I take the trash can again, and then I walk over and shut the light because I knew that would make a difference if the light was off. And sure enough, when I shut the light, Brandon, the next door neighbor kid, said, "It's going in the trash can." And I looked, and sure enough, it had slithered into the can, 
And then it popped its head back out and was like coming back towards me. And I'm not kidding you. I instantaneously went, no, no, honey, and pushed my hand and pushed the snake's oh head back God. into the, well, I knew he wasn't going to bite because he wasn't coiled. So I just pushed him in a little tongue. Hey, they're slithery. If you've ever felt them, they're not, they're just weird. So I just pushed his head back in and put it in. And then when I turned the can over, that's when he rattled. And I went, okay, he's scared. <laughs> so I took the carpet mat and put it on top, like the welcome mat. <laughs> welcome to your new home. <laughs> I put it on there and then I said to the kid, come on over here. He's like, you're not going to throw that at me, are you? I'm like, no. I go, do you have anybody you want to scare? <laughs> no. And I took him back up to the mountain and just released him on the mountain. Thankfully, he never came back into the room again. So, like a rattlesnake, I was thinking, there's George says you can love a rattlesnake, but you don't have to live with one, and he literally had one in his backyard, and he obviously didn't live with one. But if we understood acceptance, would I really get rid of the rattlesnake? I could just accept that the rattlesnake came there to live, and surrender to the backyard is now the rattlesnakes. Is that how we live? I mean, that's a thought. Well, I've also said earlier that we can do the thing where I don't accept certain things. There's some things in morality I, I won't accept, so I, I can have that. So, I, you know, at that point, I was feeling good about taking a rattlesnake away because I really would prefer George being alive over the rattlesnake being alive, because who knows if he would have come back in the house again. <laughs> so when it comes to acceptance, as I said, it relates to the, the being at peace. And when it comes to surrendering, letting go, and just, ex like, it leads to, I think surrender leads me to acceptance overall. So what I was thinking of is, um, so Mark and I were having a conversation about the fact that when you have an alcoholic in your life, do you treat them that they're always going to be an alcoholic? Because if I do, then I already have a preconceived judgment. Even if every time I've been around this couple, they are always drinking, it doesn't mean the next time I see them, they're going to be drinking. But I'm prepared that they will. So I, I have trepidation of having to go spend time with them because I know they're going to drink. And so we were talking, does that mean I'm judging them already? Or do I accept the fact that I know that they're alcoholics and they drink? I know this. Especially when it's family members. What do you do? You know it's your family. You know that's what. So do I think that they're not going to do it this time around? Well, no, because my experience has been that's what they're going to do. But am I now judging them because they haven't done it yet, but they might? Odds are they will. I would take a big bet that they're going to. But am I judging? So is that still accepting? I think knowing I accept, I think I accept that they drink. I don't have a judgment on that. I just don't want to be around it. Because when they get violent and loud, it's really not enjoyable. I mean, if you're a fun drunk, that's great. But they're not. <laughs> so. Not, I shouldn't have said that great, take, delete that part. So <laughs> what I have is people that I know are in my life, they drink, I accept their actions, but I don't want to be around them, like the rattlesnake. I can love you, but I don't want to be around you. It's just I'd rather be home playing with the kids or reading than spending time listening to people drinking and telling me things that I'm not really invested in hearing or being around, you know, the last drunk they did and the last thing they did and whatever. So, and I know that judgment is connected in that, so I guess the best thing would be for me to just accept them for who they are and accept the time I do. So this leads me to, many of you have heard me say this, my, my, my three-day venture to New York. I can go to New York for three days and accept my family, do it, but at the end of three days, I need to leave. It's like my limit. Somehow my limit has not been expanded. It's the three days and that's it. Now, I accidentally let this slip one time, and my father was there, and he heard me say that. So he assumed it was because of my mom. Oh, you can only be around your mom three days. I'm like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I didn't want to say that to him either, because both of them are quite challenging. Well, the whole family thing is quite challenging for me. So I know when I go back there, I surrender for three days, I accept them, whatever you want to do, it's okay, even though I don't want to do the things they're wanting me to do. My mother is priceless, as most mothers, even though she's not an Italian, she couldn't be an Italian mother. Food, food, everything is always food, food, food. For breakfast, I make you breakfast. I have a specific breakfast, I'm a picky eater, oatmeal, two hard boiled eggs, that's it. Her breakfast, well here you go, here's bagels. Oh, okay, 
thank you. I don't, and, oh, that's just first course. Here's cereal. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, then there's French toast. Are you kidding me? And then there's apple pie. Or, I mean, there's this like, boom, boom, boom. I, I, this is not Thanksgiving. It's breakfast. I just want one thing, I'm done. But she gets offended if you don't eat it. Why? Well, I just made it. Oh, my God. So you have to sit there. And thank God my husband has a larger stomach than me, so I kind of just pass things <laughs> off to him. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's priceless because I know what she's trying to do. She feels needed, and this is the way she takes care of her kids. So when I take a look back and think of that, I can accept that. I accept that she wants to give us food because she feels loved and that she's doing So I'll eat a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Not what I want to do, but I can do it for three days. On the fourth day, don't you dare feed me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I know I have that limit within me. So I'm aware of that. So I accept that. I accept that I could do it for three days. I make my plans for three days, and then we'll usually stay a day later and nobody's around. And we're good. We could do what we want and then head out. When it comes to acceptance, again, as I said, it, it turns into me being peace. So a couple other things that I had to put down here. Perhaps my task, back to the idea of having to be with my the people who drink, I I'm concerned with the what ifs. Well, how about not thinking about what ifs? Why don't I just stay with what is right now? So if I stay with what is right now, they're not drunk right now. There's, well, I don't know. I'm not with them. <laughs> but maybe the moment. Just stay in the moment right now. Instead of thinking the what ifs. What if the rattlesnake bites me? What if the building falls down? What if I get into a car accident? If I have all those what ifs in my life, I'm not in the moment anymore. So maybe my task is to stay in this present moment. Stay right here and not worry about the what ifs. Just take on what happens right now. Just take it on without a judgment. Well, how will I do it this way? How, well, it doesn't matter. Everything requires a different situation anyway. Time is always evolving. I ought to be always evolving with time. Every event evolves as well. So instead of doing the what ifs, what am I just, as I said, what is right now? Each moment is an, op an opportunity for me to accept. So I have moments to accept people's points of view. In Omega, we have tons of opportunities to accept opposite points of view. And the idea is not to be able to just say, oh, I'm listening to your point of view, and walk away thinking, what an idiot. That's not accepting when I walk away and think, what an idiot. If I walk away and think, oh, I couldn't get them to think my way, that is not accepting. If I walk away and I'm upset because my point wasn't heard, that is not accepting. Accepting would be I walk away feeling grateful that I had an opportunity to expand my capacity. Oh, that was a good, challenging conversation. That would be accepting. Neither right nor wrong. That was just a good, challenging conversation. Maybe I could see from their point of view. Does that really? Well, maybe they do have a valid point of view. That is accepting. Anything other than that, it's not. Yeah, we call it non-acceptance. So gratitude comes into play, which I happen to love the word gratitude. Never made the connection that gratitude and acceptance go together. I think, that, I think they really do. I'm grateful for the expansion that I have. So then the final thing I came up with, the last thought I had was, I think that acceptance and surrender are two very powerful positions to be in. I think they're both very valid, but I really feel like surrender comes first. I surrender to the moment and then accept what comes. That's what seems to be the best play. It seems to be the best action. I know I can have acceptance, but I think if I surrender to the moment first and then accept what comes, I'll find freedom. If I don't surrender at the moment and an accepting position comes, I may not accept it because I haven't surrendered yet. So I feel like those both come into play. So it involves trust. It involves um, compassion, empathy for another individual, and then the quest to find that divinity within every individual. So when I surrender to the moment, 11 people show up, and I accept what unfolds, and look for the divinity in every individual, then I feel like that's probably the most powerful place to be, and the most um, compassionate. I was going to say accepting, but I don't want to use the right word, but it is. It's the most accepting place to be, that whatever unfolds, unfolds, and it is what it is. I had um, recently used a book, recently, used a book in satsang, you guys will know what it is, it, where it talks about every situation it was meant to, it's the perfect 
It's the perfect thing for that moment. At this moment, it's the perfect thing that had to happen. So when I take that philosophy that everything happens is perfect, it's the perfect moment for it to happen for me to grow, then I find freedom and acceptance. So then back to little Ivan's body laying on the sand. Can I find acceptance in a four-year-old's body lying on the sand? Well, yeah. He had four years to live. He brought joy to some people. His father obviously loved him. His mother and brother obviously loved him. So then I, so I can easily find a divinity in a child. That's an easy thing. But do I find a divinity in the ISIS people? There's my challenge. The people that are causing all of these refugees, can, I can definitely find divinity in the refugees completely attached to them when we see them online or on the, on the TV. But when I go back to one step further, the cause of that, can I find the divinity in the ISIS individuals? It has to be there. Because that's what he said. He said that you do not, where is it right again? You do not, do not consider a man hopeless because he does wrong. You accept the divinity in him, not his vices or his crimes. That is a challenge. To find those that are crossing my values and still find their divinity has to be there because everyone has it within them. It may not be active, it may not be awake, but it's there. According to Torkum, the more I look for the divinity in an individual who has, I'm going to use the word evil, leading their lives, the more I search for that divinity, my quest for the divinity will actually pull their divinity out of them. That's what he believes. So if I'm searching, then I can think, I may not get it, but at least I'm questing for that divinity, and maybe that quest will pull the divinity out of them, and they will find it, or it will emerge, if enough, if enough people. I remember years ago during an Academy Awards um, speech, you know how the actors always get up there, but this is the first time anybody ever did this, it was Richard Gere. He got up to the front to receive his award, and instead of acceptance speech, he said, please, everyone, close your eyes up right now and pray for the people in Tibet. Mm -hmm. It was the first time anybody got up there and used the public as a way to unite the world. And, you know, we've had these experiences in my lifetime, in the 70s or the 80s, I think it was, Hands Across America. felt so blessed that I was able to do that. Hands Across America was one of the most moving experiences that I, in humanity, standing on the George Washington Bridge, holding hands with hundreds of thousands of people in New York City alone, knowing that I was in one of the links that went from New York, I think it was went all the way from New York down to New Jersey through Pennsylvania, and we finally lost it towards the bottom of Pennsylvania, but that was a very large connection of people, and feeling that connectivity, that was acceptance, too. that was surrender right there. You just, I remember holding hands, and at the appointed time, they played simultaneously across the country. I think the song was Hands Across America. It was one song, across, and simultaneously, and I remember listening, the DJ in LA was the one who, who started it. So it was the LA DJ, and I remember standing there thinking, I'm listening to something that's happening in LA right now. Even though it's, it's 12 o'clock here, it's 9 o'clock in the morning there, but we're both doing the same thing at the same time. It was my first connection to unity, and universality. And I remember feeling just holding and just crying. I mean, almost everybody was standing there, we were just crying. We couldn't understand why we were crying. It was just that sensation. And so I think, to me, that's a good picture of surrender. That you step into the movement or the moment, the flow of what's unfolding, and you feel more of just you. It wasn't just me standing there, it was me and the rest of everyone else holding hands, practicing finding the divinity in us. And in that moment, there was no war. In that moment, there was no crime. In that moment, there was no hatred. It was nothing but peace and love. So that brings me back to the idea, if I can continue to find and search for the divinity in those people that I consider undivine, perhaps my quest will awaken that divinity. And I think that's a pretty good task to do. After all, as a human being, it's really not just about my growth, it's about my contribution. And if my contribution could assist in the elevation of another contribution, I would think that'd be a worthwhile task for me to take on. 
So that's how I ended up with my swirling little understanding of surrender and acceptance, and I feel like they really go together. I must accept first, surrender, excuse me, I surrender to the moment first, and I accept what comes. That gives me my freedom and my peace. And I felt, actually I have to tell you this, by the time I finished writing this paper, I felt pretty good about the fact that I now have a clear understanding of what acceptance is, as well as surrender. So I hope you enjoyed my little stories and lectures. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. I look forward to seeing you in a month. Have a good night. Hopefully it'll, dry, it'll rain again on the ride home. So thank you. And if you want, if you want a copy of the notes, if you just put your email address on oh, that yes, sheet over there, that. we if can email If you want a copy of my notes, they'll be on that. I'll send them out to you tomorrow as a PDF. What's your definition of divinity? Divinity. That's another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, off the cuff, if I had to say it, I think divinity would be the highest aspect of me that there is. Whether I say it's my higher power, the God within, the essence of the human being, unity, Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness, any one of those words. I think all those terms really boil down to something I can't quite put my finger on, a spark that we all have within us. I think that would be the lovability, or hmm? the lovability of that person. Yeah, the ability to love and, yeah, and accept. <laughs> Good question, thank you. I should have asked, does anybody have any questions? Excellent. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. <laughs>